G'day and welcome to the Grow Small Business Podcast. I'm your host, Troy Truen. Each week, we speak with an owner who has grown a business with 5 to 30 team members to something bigger. Diving into their numbers and unearthing the pain they've experienced, we explore what they did to overcome each barrier and what they would do differently from day one. Let's get into it. We'll have all the show notes and any resources mentioned in the cast on our website. Aged 25 in 2006 with his then wife, started a physio business in a 4x4 metre room. Fast forward 14 years and they now have 14 practices, 12 franchisees and 270 team members, only losing one during COVID. The practices took a hit during the pandemic. The team prepared for their customers' return and business exceeded their expectations, setting new records. Launched a mobile home care arm a few years ago. In COVID times, it grew 30% off a large base. After separating seven years ago, he and his wife are still 50-50 business partners. They almost went bankrupt in 2016, went down to the last $2 in their bank. Funding through bank debt and profits, felt he had succeeded when when they got through almost bankruptcy. Hardest thing about growing a small business is overcoming the middle growing pains, around $2 million per annum. What Jonathan would tell himself on day one of starting out is, keep your head out of the clouds and stay grounded. Go back and listen to episode 35, where Annette talks about inventing a leading horseshoe which sells in Europe, USA, Canada, New Zealand, and Australia. From two FTE in 2015 to now 11, and sales growing between 25% and 125% each year. Welcome everyone. Today I'm interviewing Jonathan Moody from Physio Inc. based in Sydney. Thanks for your time today, Jonathan. No worries. Nice to be here. How we know each other? Uh, a mutual friend of ours, Steve McCulloch, who you went to university with and I play golf with every couple of weeks, uh, suggested you might be a great guest to have on the cast. Yeah, Steve's another victim to moving to uh, Hobart and never coming back. Yeah, that's right. They've sold up the house and moved here permanently after trying it 15 months ago and yeah, loving it. There's a lot of people doing that. That's my fourth friend out of Sydney that have pretty much sold up and moved down in the last year or so. Yeah, I've got another good friend of mine that shifted his family down there and they don't look like they'll be coming back anytime soon. Great. Yeah, it's a beautiful place. So tell our audience a bit about your business, what it does and how it makes money. Our business is uh, Physio Wink. We originally kicked off in 2006 as the everyday mum and dad physio clinic in the western suburbs of Sydney. We, uh, myself and my wife at the time, Irene, we developed a network of practices across uh, the city. We got up to 10 practices um, in Sydney by about 2012. Uh, in recent times, we have uh, pivoted to working with mobile in home care in addition to our clinic footprint. Uh, our business is effectively three streams. We have corporately owned physiotherapy practices. We have a franchised, um, which is, um, you know, we have 12 clinics under franchise underneath the PhysioLink brand, and we have a mobile disability and aged care in-home service. Great. That's a good diverse uh, stream of revenues. Yeah, d- diversity has been a thing that has been increasingly important with the uncertainty with, you know, funding mechanisms and funding um, ways that, uh, you know, with government spending a huge amount of money, we know that, you can't uh, put your all, all your eggs in one basket. When the economy turns south and you know private work decreases, government can sometimes fill it in. But being diversified across it all is what we're trying to um, trying to achieve. Yeah, great. And you've had quite a big uptick, I'm guessing, since COVID hit with the mobile side of the business. That's right. Yeah, it it was COVID was an exciting time, and I don't say that you know you know in any other way than it was very dynamic place to be in business. And as a, as a leader, you know, you, you had leaders that ran for the hills. You had ones that really embraced and then stood in the front line. And those businesses that really embraced the challenge and, um, you know, were forced to innovate, which is okay. Innovation it can either be forced or can be done by strategy, um, did quite well through COVID. There was um, surprisingly quite a large amount of, uh, you know, stimulus cash that was washing around in the system. Um, and so as a, as a business that, you know, has got a, a hefty payroll, it, it enabled us to have quite a buffer to be able to continue to hire and invest in our frontline workforce. Uh, in terms of the in-home space, going into clinics was something that uh, was controversial as to whether or not it was essential service or not. And so the yep. in-home space did certainly increase. Um, we were extremely um, cautious around PPE and making sure that 
both the client and our workers were, were safe and responsible in maintaining social distance and uh, taking all necessary precautions. And as a result, we were able to pick up quite a large amount of, of uh, market share and growth during that period. And, uh, you know, during the, you know, the major air part of, of COVID, we grew at uh, 30% in our mobile and in-home space. And, um, you know, and it's from a reasonably large base as well. So we were quite happy to say we, we went in there and batted for the, for the clients. They were very isolated like everybody else. Uh, people in aged care and, and disability services in terms of the clients can, they're very high, high at risk of mental health and, yep. and suffering from you know, extra things. They're often in pain. They have difficulty ambulating around the home. They're isolated generally. And so we really felt as though it was our duty to make sure that they don't become isolated, that we don't have any long tail issues with immobility and, and uh, you know, reduction in their ability to get out and participate and have access to the community at the end of COVID. And uh, so that was our mantra, that no, don't give up on your clients, um, support them and be there for them. And did you find, did the clinics take much of a hit? The clinics took a really hard hit in the first month. And that was because of, you know, the, the flight of the client out the door. It, it was, you know, effectively it felt like panic stations. It, it, you know, I remember that first few days, it was almost like a, a nuclear bomb had, had hit the earth when everybody had to go into lockdown. And the clinics did experience quite a strong flight. Now, we were well ahead of the preparation curve on that, which was great. Um, and that, you know, significant downturn in the clinics happened for a few weeks. Mm. Um, we were able to recover because of the preparation that we put in. Uh, every single client that had been seen in the previous two years were, were given a call to see. And it was an are you OK call. Yep. You know, are you OK? Are you coping? How is your mental health? How's your stress? It was not a sales call. It was to connect all of the people that had supported our business with a healthcare professional to make sure they were okay. Yep. Um, that resulted in when we were able to get back into wholeheartedly working within the constraints of the, the restrictions in clinic with a swathe of people who um, knew that we legitimately cared. They had issues from, with working from home because working from home setups are horrible. Yeah. And all of the you know, frontline workers extremely important that Woolworths packers are still seen, you know, people that are, are truck drivers to keep Australia moving, that they were all seen. So the definition of what essential was, um, I was a fierce campaigner around saying that, you know, essential doesn't mean you have to be dying. It means that you have to be able to cope with being able to keep the country um, going. And we, under that guise, we, we um, embraced being able to serve our clients both with telehealth and face-to-face -face with social distancing and PPE in place. Our industry went through a bit of turmoil with regards to infighting about opinions on how they should, um, you know, conduct business. We had a lot of, you know, business owners on social media fighting with one another, saying you should all shut down. Um, other ones saying, you know, we're essential. Um, I generally stayed clear of any, you know, um, of any fighting and just listen to the, the narrative of, you know, the national um, advice yep. and whatever we were allowed to do. Um, I promised my staff that whatever we were allowed to do, we would do and we would prepare really well for that. Yep. Um, it's not up to me to decide how the, how the country should run in terms of medicine. And so I, I steered clear of opinion and innuendo and just went with the, the, the narrative of what we should do. Yeah. And now what we're about 10, 11 months into COVID really, have the clinics got back to about the level they were pre-COVID? The clinics are all doing records now. Wow. So one of the things that happened very early on was I, I read an article about the sec, an alternate second wave. And the alternate second wave is about a pent-up demand of healthcare needs. And that pent-up demand is people not visiting their doctor with cancer symptoms. It's people not visiting their doctor's with symptoms of diabetes or, you know, ulcerated legs from immobility or, you know, not going into bed with bed sores, I mean, not going to the hospital with bed sores. And so understanding that there was potentially a second wave coming, we had a no person gets left behind policy. Only um, one employee um, who was very, very early on um, was, was let go from one of our franchise clinics, but, at, but out of 260 
um, employees, we only lost one. So we almost achieved our no one gets left behind policy because I knew that the second wave of healthcare demand was going to come. Yep. As soon as we came out of lockdown, uh, just about all of our clinics did record numbers. Wow. And it, it, it surprised even myself who knew the second wave was going to come. And it was a combination of working from home because people are now more available. A lot of our clinics are in suburban areas. Uh, they're more available to attend their practice uh, because they've got more flexible working arrangements. Um, so, you know, uh, yes, we were prepared, um, but there's always in, in business as there as anything, there's a bit of luck involved um, yeah. that, you know, we, we probably couldn't have foreseen that because of the flexible working arrangements from home, we're going to be a net beneficiary with musculoskeletal clinics. I was going to say, I assume a lot more people working from home uh, and particularly wouldn't be setting their home office up so well from a, 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 a you know, physiological point of view and that would have brought along along more um, health issues from the way people percent eat or like I've been using a standing desk now for five years and I love it but it's uh, I assume a lot of people would have just cleared a desk somewhere chuck a couple of books on the, on the table put their laptop on and even then you know don't have the right posture which would bring about some of, some of the issues that you guys help with yeah and that laptop positioning the fact that they sit quite below the eye line is, is quite detrimental to the to the body so you know neck issues that then uh proliferate into shoulder issues and and you know more broadly upper limb problems and upper back problems become a lot more profound um and you know there's a golden rule with uh with any type of ergonomic setup variety is key being able to be able to shift your posture and have a dynamic posture is great that's why standing desks are, are wonderful because you can move around you can shift your weight forwards and backwards mm -hmm. um and where, when you're setting up a, a, an environment in home, if you're trying to set up an environment that's very stationary, it's all, even if it's a good environment that you're setting up, if it's stationary, it's fraught with danger. So, you know, making sure that you're taking regular breaks and, and having a variety of different postures is, um, is, is essential. Yeah. And so how many clinics have you got at the moment, including the, fran the 12 franchises? We've got 14 practices in the network now. Yep. Um, those 14 clinics have a employment base of around 90 FTE. Mm -hmm. um, and then the other part of our business, uh, the in-home uh, disability and aged care, we, we employ uh, 170 staff um, mm -hmm. directly and as part of the support head office there. Great. So, and are you just working in New South Wales? We're across everywhere. We are now in Hobart. We have... Uh, we do have Naomi down in Hobart and OT down there, which is great. Uh, we are across all states and territories, except for Northern Territory and ACT now. Yep. And so, but your 14 clinics, uh, are they... So, yeah, so we have 14 practices. We've got a practice in Perth, we've got a practice in Melbourne, and the rest of them are through New South Wales. And, uh, you know, our intention is part of our, you know, strategic goal for, um, for the next uh, 12 months is to have a clinic in each capital city right. in order to have a national network that will be able to achieve some of the long-term goals that we have of being able to service, um, you know, uh, musculoskeletally cradle to the grave, you know, for insurance companies who might want rehab done outside of hospital that we will have the ability to work with national partners to be able to... Uh, uh, you know, work with other national partners that have difficulty finding that footprint. Yeah. I've had a few, I've had a handful of people on the cast that have franchised their business. Um, what's your experience being with working with franchisees? Franchisees that we currently have in our business, we're lucky. They, a vast majority of them were um, hometown wins. They were people that were employees and, and understood the culture of what we're about. They're relentless and ruthless to maintain that culture. Uh, we have some house rules that we live and die by that employees come first. It's our first house rule. Yeah. Um, the second one is uh, that every client gets an incredible experience and the third referrers are treated like royalty. So when you've got internal people taking on the franchise clinics, there's that natural infection of their culture just infects, you know, their workplace. Yeah. Um, now, equally, we've been fortunate that, uh, you know, the two members that have come externally and, and uh, Victoria, Claire and Cathy and in Perth, uh, physio ink through and through. They have it in their blood to serve. Uh, we have a very bottom-up business where the leaders of the business serve 
their employees. Mm -hmm. And and it, it is our absolute mantra that we are there to foster growth. We are there to showcase that a, that a corporate environment or, or a, a business can be a good role model for people so that, you know, they will be better humans when they go home with their children. And so are we lucky? Maybe. Maybe when we get to 40 or 50, I'll have a different conversations with you, but we're not there yet. So you um, haven't had any mishires on the franchisee level yet? You've had not, on the, not on the franchisee level. Right. Maybe it's to do with what, what, our, what our goal is. So, you know, my goal is to help young business owners um, succeed. And now success is very different. Mm -hmm. You know, the, the, my goal is not to grow my revenue base as a franchisor. My goal is to um, help young business owners succeed. Now, succeed might be able to um, have a flexible working arrangement where they only consult one or two days a week and they can look after their child two days a week and play golf one, one day a week. That might be success to them. Yep. And so, you know, we talk a lot about what are the sacrifices to your success. If financial success is your goal, then there might need to be sacrifices that you make in terms of free time, family, if financial goals are your, are your only consideration. But it, it really depends on the individual about what success means. And I guess that's why we haven't had any missiles yet because success is a really personal thing. Yep. And the value that you offer as a franchisor to the franchisees, I assume, is marketing and some of the back office stuff and booking, you know, consolidating the booking system, et cetera. Yeah, correct. So, so we effectively offer a turnkey uh, operation where the marketing from end to end from January to December has got a cyclical nature to it on all platforms, you know, pay-per-click, organic. We provide them with monthly plans on their digital channels or face-to-face -face channels in order to be, in a, you know, in a, a track door of clients. Yep. Um, in terms of one of the biggest headaches all businesses have is not to find good people, but to set people up for success. You know, that often uh, we mistakenly think they're the wrong person, but it's just we didn't line them up for success. And that could be through training, support. Are they the right person for that role or is a different role more suited to them? And so we've got a really strong learning management platform called IQ that uh, takes an employee of any level of their career through training, um, bespoke to where they are there and then, um, you know, so it does teach them the, the policies and procedures, but it's also about the human elements. We do a lot of soft skills training, how to make frontline healthcare workers better human beings um, to a client. Uh, with with frontline health uh, employees, their training is so uh, scientifically based, but they're all humanitarian at heart. And so there's this strange conflict where, uh, you know, they're, they're being pushed into this evidence-based world of binary numbers. If this comes to you, you should do this, but then a human's in front of them that needs a hug. Yeah. And so it's how do you balance, you know, the soft skills of, of education with the science of evidence? Yeah, yep. And 2006, when you started out, how old were you? I was, I thought I was really old. <laughs> I, was, I was 25. Wow, yep. And... Uh, and did I make the right decision moving out that early? Uh, it was the only decision I could make because that's just who I was at that time. Mm -hmm. I had a wonderful mentor at the time, Paul Wright, who's a mentor to thousands of physiotherapy businesses across the world and podiatry and, and osteopathy chiropractic. Um, Paul and I have kept in touch, um, you know, ever since. And, you know, I didn't leave Paul at the time because I was unhappy with where I was. I just left Paul at the time because that's just my path. I, I you know, I have a level of ADHD that, um, that I deal with um, uh, by pursuing things, by hunting things. Mm -hmm. It's what keeps me um, alive and fulfilled. Yeah. And I, ha I had to do that at that stage. I, I, I didn't realize that I had some um, self-esteem, well, self-esteem is probably the wrong word, but I, I did some, have some issues with self-worth at the time that I was always trying to um, please others and do things for other people instead of, um, you know, doing it for potentially the right reasons. Yep. Right. And so, you know, I, I wanted to prove that I could do something because I've always been a little bit entrepreneurial as a, as a kid. I grew mushrooms and sold them like, you know, edible mushrooms. I, I delivered newspapers. I, 
you know, we used to paint garbage bins when I was in, in high school for, for a quid on weekends. And so we're always doing, I was always doing stuff that, that would try to lead to the next business opportunity. And, you know, 98% of them were crap and, uh, and a couple of them were good. Yeah, no, I'm the same. I lawn mowing business, I think when I was 12, delivering horse shit around town for gardens, um, you know, uh, paper rounds. Yep. So I was going to say, you sound quite entrepreneurial and driven. Uh, speaking with Steve on the golf course, you know, he ex- explained to me how difficult it is to grow a physio practice, let alone a chain of them. It can be a real pain in the ass. And he's obviously been in awe at your achievements and with your team. Uh, so yeah, well done. It, it is, uh, it is very difficult to grow physio clinics. You know, the wages are high. Uh, if you're in a capital city, rent is high. Mm. Uh, the cost of the service is low for, for comparable, um, you know, uh, services, right? And there is an element of humanitarian desire where, you don't, you don't want them to have to pay sometimes. Yeah. Um, the interesting uh, thing that, that I, I, I was able early on to, I was, I've always been um, obsessed with maths. I, I loved maths at school, loved, loved physics at school. And I started measuring everything in my business really early on, like absolutely everything. Right. Uh, you know, NPS scores, return rates, clinical outcome measures, cancellation rates, measured the whole thing. And really early on, I was able to, and I can't celebrate these with a university because we'd have to go through ethics approval and, you know, it's, it's difficult to showcase private data, yeah. you know, out there in the ether. But, um, you know, to summarise, I was able to demonstrate that the more money that people invested in their health, the better the clinical outcome. Yeah. I was able to showcase that the more money that people invested in their health increased their satisfaction with the therapist and then on the flip side i was able to showcase that intra-therapist respect for other therapists so the ones that had had masters or phds had a higher spend per injury than junior therapists Mm -hmm. so any way you wanted to look at it if it was satisfaction of the patient for the service they received if it was respect internally with the industry and the colleagues or if it was on clinical outcomes it all came back to a simple truth that people that were good dealing with humans made it more made it easier for them to return because they they found the experience fulfilling and they found the experience gratifying and if you did that they would stay the course on their rehab process they would listen to your advice if you needed to give them exercises, they would actually do the exercises. Um, the university space is, is, a, is, a, is an interesting one at the moment because it's so heavily focused on evidence-based medicine mm-hmm. that you know, we have new grads coming out that aren't able to develop relationship, relationships with uh, clients because their clients don't return because they will be given an evidence-based exercise the client hasn't developed a connection with them. The client won't do the exercises. And so the clinical outcomes are poor. Yeah. And so there's a, you know, there's, there's a really, uh, there's an circle. interest. Mm. It's a vicious circle. And, and, you know, we, we have this, um, you know, internal uh, term, it's called N equals one. The only thing that matters is the human being in front of you. All of the evidence sits there and you use that as a resource, mm. but the human being in front of you, how do you need to connect to them in order for them to buy into what you are doing and you can use that across all areas you know if you're a solicitor you know the person in front of you what do they need not what do you need what does the law need what do they need? what is their what what is their unique um desire mm-hmm. or, or requirement from your services and yeah. just keep sitting in that space and, and it's difficult to fail yeah i think it's really powerful if you focus on your customers needs and make it a lot more personal experience as you said I know for myself, uh, you know, getting services from different professionals, it's, they can be streets apart and you, you just, it makes it so much easier, especially if it's something like legal that you don't really enjoy having to go through, but you have to. Um, I've obviously worked with quite a few lawyers and accountants over the years and uh, you really do notice the difference to the ones that you go back to because of their, their attention to your needs and just the way they, they, talk with you rather than just being a robot and 
giving you the, the you know, the binary. Yeah. But being, being treated as a human being is, yeah. is something that is unfortunately a little, is quite rare because, you know, like the, and the, there's, there's best intentions that are out there. You know, The E-Myth by Michael Gerber was a wonderful book that I read that probably kicked off my obsession with being able to process orientate things. I was going to ask you if that was what, yeah, but, the, but, the Bible for me. I, no, yeah. I book. And if you, lay, if you lay culture over the top of that, you win. And if you lay human over the top of that, you'll win for a long time. Yep. You know, like if you have a culture that can embrace um, process, it's wonderful. But then if you can overlay the human element, both from an employee and the client level over both of those things, you're going to be sustainable for a very long period of time. Yep. And, you know, uh, culture can win over process, you know, um, at times if you've got simple rules that your culture will go by. Um, but it's difficult to scale unless you have really good processes. Yep. Um, but it's difficult to maintain employees unless you have culture. So it's the two. The two are very, very vital to um, to success. Yeah. Um, to get to scale. And do you have some key numbers you can share to illustrate the growth of the business? Yeah, we. Uh, you know, the first year two thousand and six. Uh, it was myself in a four by four metre room in a medical centre. Wow. Uh, you know then. Four years later, we had five clinics. Um, then in 2013, we had 10. Uh, we were at around about 60 to 70 staff at that point in time in 2013. 2016, things really started to, um, to change for us. We um, increased the number of clinics by, by another two. Uh, we got into the mobile and in-home space. Uh, that was um, courtesy of uh, two particular staff members, well, one in particular who was a, um, a client relationship manager at one of our clinics. What that means is, a, um, you know, the administration front, 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 front desk. Um, she had a lived experience with a daughter who had a, um, an acquired brain injury and she was very passionate to support people in the NDIS who uh, were navigating a new system. And so we put quite a lot of resources into um, supporting her passion to support people with disabilities. And obviously, as a result, we used allied health to serve those people, but we also got into some support coordination. And so 2016 is when our business really uh, knew that you can get people to chase their passions and their niches. And, uh, you know, the NDIS was new and, and we didn't jump on it because it was a gravy train because I've always had actually a bit of a disdain for government-based work, to be brutally honest. I, I, I don't like anything that's outside of my control of doing a direct b2c relationship and just exchanging a commercial amount of money becomes makes the the, the relationship a little bit uh, awkward when somebody else is paying for it because the therapist then may reduce the quality of their service because they don't need to impress the client because it's not their money like it's there's lots of foundations that i needed to um, make sure we're rock solid before getting into um, third party based work and uh, but it was a real uh, it was a real journey from 2016 with you know around about 80 staff. We're now four years later. We're at 270 odd. Um, we've been growing at 200 percent for the last three years. Um, so, that's top line. Yeah, yeah. Wow. Um, now there were some years like I nearly went bust in 2006, 2016. Now I nearly went broke. Um, I've got a very interesting. Uh, shareholder situation. Myself and my my um, former wife Irene are still 50-50 shareholders in the business mm -hmm. and we still work together in the business. Yep. We've been separated now for seven or eight years. We get along well. Uh, it's, a, it's a partnership where we have our own strengths and weaknesses and uh, she heads up, um, you know, a part of our mobile and community team and she does it extraordinarily well. We have got a very open, um, you know, uh, working relationship we've got an eight-year-old son together and uh it's an everyone said we couldn't do it <laughs> and you know we, we're both you know contrarians to some degree we're both incredibly stubborn yep and because everyone said we couldn't do it we're like fuck it we're gonna make this happen like we're gonna gonna... You we can yeah <laughs> and and the irony is is that the business wouldn't be as good with one or the other yeah. you know it's, it's just one of those things yeah, that's a great that's a great achievement for you both. 
Yeah. And, and, you know, and we've, we've got a child together. We're always going to be yeah. together in some way, shape and form. And, yeah. you know, what legacy can we show our child? Our yeah. leg- the legacy can be mum and dad can still work together. Mum Absolutely. and dad can still be, you know, normal human beings. And, yeah, boardrooms can get pretty fruity. Um, <laughs> you know, when there's a la- layer of, of history there, yeah. it can be enjoyable for other staff members to, you know, sit behind the glass wall and listen to us having a, a robust discussion. But it's, uh, that's just, you know, but five minutes later, you know, we're, we're back to business as usual. Yeah. And so it's a really, um, it's really, um, ah, well, it's just still a family business. I had a meeting yesterday with a potential new um, business that I may um, chair an advisory board of and uh, of uh, this is four or five owners of the business and two of them are romantically together, husband and wife. I think they're married, maybe they're not. Anyway, they haven't slept much in the last few weeks because they're so busy going through so much growing pains and the male was particularly cranky and I've never seen him cranky before. I'm going to have a chat to him over the years with his cast or his wife will. Um, and it was quite interesting to watch them both niggle at each other. And I just sat back and because I know them reasonably well as well, but just to chuckle. But I could only imagine, but back on the relationship, I think that's a really good point. A lot of parents that separate, split up, miss, I think, miss the point that it's not about them and, and winning an argument with your ex, et cetera. The, for, for Kate and I, my ex, the first discussion we had in priority was uh, our daughter's seven and a half, was about her welfare and what kind of role models were we going to be if, as a lot of um, busted partnerships are where you've got people throwing chairs at each other, which is a phrase mm. I use quite often, you know, and we get along really well. We don't always, we're both uh, fairly stubborn Scorpios. So we have our fiery moments, but uh, in, all in all, it's just better to get along and, you know, for, for everyone's sake. hundred percent. And, and, you know, kids are very resilient when their parents are resilient mm. and, and, you know, resilience comes out in a lot of ways and being able to, be civil with one another is a is a form of resilience, mm. and uh, and and your child will learn that you know to a degree they compartmentalise a bit when they're with the other parent because that's how you know kids often live in the moment. Yep. Um, we've got one that lives literally in the second. Like he can barely he's eight and a half years old. He can barely read a clock because he has no he has no desire to read a clock because time means nothing. You know, if you ask him what time it is, it's now, Dad. <laughs> now is the time. Yeah. Yeah. And there's there's a beauty in that. And so as parents, you know, supporting their desire to um, live for loving experience is just so important in any sort of family setup. Yeah, totally agree. When was the moment you felt like you'd succeeded? I'll tell you when I do feel like that. <laughs> and there, there's, is that? There, yeah, there's an element of what... You know, I was talking about before, what is success? Mm-hmm. I look at the chairman of my board and, you know, he, uh, he advises. Um, so we've got an advisory board. It's not a formal board. And he advises lots of different businesses, much like uh, yourself. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think that would be a wonderful thing. I'd love to advise my own business. Yeah. <laughs> it sounds really odd. I reckon that I will feel success when I'm advising my own business. Mm-hmm. Um, you, know, uh, you know, the old cliches, uh, you you don't work in your business, you work on your business. Yeah, that's Gerber, yep. Yeah, to a degree. As long as you're sitting in a chair of a C-suite or a management role, you're still always working in it, you know, to, to a degree. Mm. And working on it to me could be advising the business, you know. And uh, in terms of, you know, legitimate success, um, I feel like I succeeded when I got through that running very close to bankruptcy. Yeah, maybe just touch on that. So what brought that about in 2016? What was the thing that you just didn't keep an eye on the numbers or you lost a big client base or? Two things happened. Uh, we, you know, I said I like to measure everything. Mm-hmm. Garbage in, garbage out is, is another great rule. Yeah. Um, if you're measuring the wrong, wrong crap, you're going to make some really stupid decisions. And I made some of the dumbest decisions in business in hindsight that if I had have had better data Mm -hmm. and effectively it was because i was working too much on accrual based accounting you know net profits and not enough off cash based forecasts yep and cash is king Mm -hmm. we ran out and i and i shit the bed and you know and it it was it was brutal like we you know we had a had a payroll of you know like i the payroll was huge and it was two dollars 
left in the payroll. Jeez. After all line of credit, all lines of credit were down. And once you pay, once you miss payroll, you're done. Like, you know, that, that's, that's business done. Like you've, you've failed 50 mortgages and businesses that have car, you know, people that have got car mm -hmm. payments and like you failed like that, that's a problem. And, uh, oh, I, like, we begged, borrowed and st stole to get through that. And thank God there were some people that believed in us at the time. Mm -hmm. um, we got through then turned a cash profit two years later. A cash profit. Like, holy crap, I was nearly broke and turned a cash profit. And now I look back on those days and that was success because it was, you know, um, nose to the grindstone, serious hustling, to make make it, it work. Now, the other bit, the other bit to that story is that I we had scaled up pretty aggressively for that previous three or four years, and we uh, scaled up our systems, didn't scale up our culture, didn't scale up accountability and responsibility, didn't scale up the things that actually made the heart and soul of an organisation robust, and so we found that um, we were no longer serving our staff as a, as a leadership team. And by a leadership team, I mean Irene and myself, we weren't serving our staff. We were wanting the staff to serve us more. And we didn't realise it creeps up on you quickly because we weren't walking the halls as much as we previously were. You know, we weren't getting out and, and shaking hands with every single employee, looking them in the eye and asking them how they, how they were. And... It was just one of those things where um, I'm really glad that we almost didn't get away with it because if we did get away with it, we would have a business that doesn't have the loving culture that we got back because we had it and then we lost it. Yeah. And it disappears and you don't notice it disappearing until it's gone. And uh, so the culture eroded. That led to the fact that you know we weren't making a, a cash surplus. Yeah. That led to, um, you know, us making change, yeah. and thank God we went through that. So I would say, in, to to answer your question, that's when I realised I succeeded. That yeah. I had some tenacity, mm -hmm. um, and uh, tenacity is something that you know all entrepreneurs um, face. You know, a lot of them go broke, yeah. and um, the ones that that, that don't go broke um, usually have a fair bit of tenacity. And so you literally down to $2 in the bank. That's all you had left. $2 in the bank, $100,000 overdraft, owed a, a family member another hundred grand. Yeah. And um, oh, oh. so that was, you know, go to the ATO, beg, beg, borrow and steal for not having to make any more payments for a period of time. Um, you know, renegotiate as much as we humanly could. Yeah. Um, have a big smile on your face with your staff. Everything will be okay. Yeah. Um, we weren't trading insolvently um, because we were able to continue to have other sources of income. We sold nearly every asset we had, mm -hmm. sold a you know, family home. Uh, we sold another clinic location that we had some equity in. We just had to sell everything. Um, you know, we'd, <laughs> you know, it's garage sale stuff. Yeah. And, <laughs> yeah. and uh, you know, and that, that's, that's, that's how it was. Um, it's a phenomenal turnaround, Jonathan. And, and now we're, it's it's a re it's really odd. So it's one of the reasons why I caution um, uh, talking about success because I'm still living in a little bit of la la land that is this real. I pinch myself, my, myself and my accountant and my finance manager. We're like, shit, DK. Do you remember when it used to not be like this? Yes. Do you remember four years ago? How the hell did we get here? <laughs> yeah. Like it's re it's a really unusual feeling of having that humility of of. Um, we will, I think I will always be a small business now. And by that, I mean the, the mentality. Yep. I will never lose sight of the fact that that one individual employee who might be a receptionist or a young physio first year out, I will never lose sight of the fact that they donate 38 hours of their week and life is very precious, time is precious. And they, they donate that time for, for something that I've created. Mm -hmm. And I'm never going to lose sight of that. And that, that, that excites me. I love that saying, sales is vanity, profit is sanity, and cash is reality. Yeah, yeah. Just and back on, you said a minute ago, um, 
about you working on the business and pretty much just sitting on the board. Uh, that's something I've transitioned to in the last couple of years. I finished my first, uh, finished up my last, sorry, um, management role uh, mid this year. So now all I do is sit on boards, chair boards, mm. so five boards that I sit on. And I'm absolutely loving it because uh, you get to get in a room with a bunch of other smart people, uh, have an intense conversation about a topic and all these decisions are made and then I don't have to do a fucking thing. I can go away. <laughs> I, don't, I don't have to fire anyone directly anymore, et cetera, which is uh, the least fun thing I have to do in business. Yep. Uh, as we've just had one recently, a redundancy, which um, hasn't gone so well, but I, you know, I'm, not in the fi- I'm not in the day-to-day firing line and I'm really, really enjoying that. Plus just uh, getting so much value out of these discussions with other directors or advisory board members. It is, it is amazing. I'm, I write a leadership memo for our, um, our, anybody from a senior physio to a clinic team lead or a team leader or right up into our executive team. I write a leadership memo every month. And the, so I'm up to uh, volume 33 and uh, this, this one I'm doing about my lessons that I've learned. And one of the moments that was really liberating is knowing that I, I'm not as smart as I thought that I was. Mm-hmm. And it's a, it's a thing that comes with age. I'm 39 now. I'm still feel very, I still feel quite young. Um, and knowing that you're not as smart as a bunch of other smart people in a room is a super liberating thing because yep. you dodge a lot of bullets. Yep. Uh, you, you, you put the brakes on things that are shit ideas. Yep. Um, and gee whiz, a lot of collective brains make a lot more sense than the brains of one human being that might take a crap and then come up with a great idea, you know, five minutes and have, have not thought through it. Um, and, you know, I, I've, for that reason, I've absolutely adored having an advisory board in place for the last nine months. Mm-hmm. It has been something that I can't believe I didn't do earlier. Yep. And... Um, in terms of where I'd like to be in the future, maybe it's in 10 years, five years, 15 years, I don't know when that time is. I do love imparting um, cultural leadership as a CEO mm-hmm. and I have to be happy to say goodbye to that before I would, you know, um, get it, get to that, you know, board level. Yeah. Um, at the moment, you know, uh, I, I don't feel like a fraud, but... You know, if, if only anybody knew what's inside young CEOs' brains in terms of it's like, holy shit, you guys are all following me on this journey. You know, I hope I don't fuck it up, you know. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. What does success look like to you? Yeah, su- success effectively means just choices. That's what it means to me, choices. You, you can make the, you, you have the choice to work, you have the choice to play, you have the choice to do what it is that makes you tick. Yep. Um, flexibility and choice is success. The number one thing you'd recommend to marketing a fast growing business? <laughs> uh, making sure that end to end you're measuring results. Yep. That's right. really key, you know, and being able to say hand on heart, uh, I've spent a dollar on this and it's resulted in eight bucks out here. Now that's, that's the, that's the short term marketing piece, you know, that's the heroin marketing and then you've got the brand marketing yep. and, and, Having a, a level of, sat- of of budgeting where you're happy for long tail brand spend, but knowing that you're going to stick to that budget, knowing that you're happy for your brand just to be to generate a level of awareness that's not going to get clicks, that's not going to you know result in that. It's just going to help people know that you're the business that's for them, and when they need you, they'll get they'll work with you. So dividing your budget up. What's the short term? What's the long term? Long term should be like with social media and organic social media. That's long term. Time and effort goes into that. And that's showing a potential client what type of organisation you are. Don't just constantly pitch to people on social media because then it's not social media. It's bloody advertising media. So that would be my advice. Uh, Watch your budgets. Know how much you're spending before you're getting back and be happy with a brand-based awareness budget that you stick to as a percentage. Yeah, good. What about funding the business? So you're fifty fifty with your ex wife. Have you had any other investors along the way, or uh, it- it's just it's been just us. Yep. Um, you know, we fund the business through debt yep. rather than you know, was <laughs> we fund it through debt rather than smart money. You know, smart money often you can get good investors in that have got a certain level of expertise. Um, we've always 
wanted to remain reasonably uncomplicated in the way that, that we deal. Yep. Uh, and so that's how, that's how we've been. Um, you know, we're living in an interesting place in Australia at the moment where the desire for private equity in the health, in the health game is just off the charts. Yes. Mm. Um, I enjoy having the conversations because, you know, they've, they've all, they're all reading the same script and I kind of just, I, I enjoy, I enjoy watching a bloke in his late twenties, early thirties that doesn't really know much about business um, come and pitch me the reason why um, a private equity firm should buy my business. So we've never really gone down that path because um, the non-tangibles of how easy the relationships are in our business um, mean a lot to us. Yep. And, and we haven't needed to. Oh, well, maybe we did need to. We never went broke. But um, <laughs> it wasn't worth anything back then. So. And with the bank finance, you've actually got one of those banks that are unheard of that actually lend you money <laughs> when you're growing because <laughs> it's quite, quite hard. Yeah, the, yeah, so do I like banks? Look, um, they only give you money when you're doing well. That's right. Mm. And, that, and it's, it's sad. And I guess there's some sort of uh, rhyme and reason to that. Um, but, yeah, they only give you money when, when you're doing well. And the funny thing is that they're like, well, and we'll be happy for you to continue to have that money, but we want to see your books every year. And if your books go south, we want all the money back. And it's like, well that's when you won't be able to get your money back. You know, there's a, it, it's a difficult relationship yeah. um, that what's a better system. Uh, probably smart money investors yeah. would be a better system to do, but that does complicate things. Yeah. And if you were to start up today with plenty of funding, would you go into your industry? Oh, that's a really good question. I do have a, um, I do have a bit of a, a, a desire to be in an industry that, is slightly more binary, but I don't think I'd find it as satisfying. Yep. You know, like selling of widgets. Yeah. You know, whatever it is. Uh, there's something really gratifying around making a change to a web page mm -hmm. and you sell more widgets. It's, it's really like, you know, this cause and effect relationship. Mm -hmm. With us in the service industry, you have to put training into staff for 12 months or two years to see any cause and effect. And so it's a, a longer tail. Um, but those, those things that I enjoy about what I'm doing now aren't available in the widget making industry. So um, I'd probably do something similar. Yep. Great. And can you outline the most stressful point in your small business growth journey so our audience can learn from it? Yeah. Um, I, I haven't been particularly... Um, I haven't been particularly attached to the dollar. Um, really early on, I, I realized it didn't matter if I was earning 50 grand or 100 grand, it didn't really change the needle on happiness. What changed the needle on happiness was, was the time that I was putting into family and friends and community. So money hasn't been a big, big driver. And whilst you know, we nearly went broke, was that the most stressful time? Probably not. I would say the most stressful time is when um, I've been hurt by personal relationships whereby staff members have done something that they really shouldn't have done. Mm -hmm. And I'm needing to deal with the ramifications of those relationships. Mm -hmm. I find the individual relationship of staff members because we, we get very attached to one another. Um, you know, there's been one or two times in my career where um, you know, I firmly believe that everyone's trying to do the right thing. Generally, everyone's trying to do the right thing. Mm -hmm. And when it really looks like someone isn't trying, wasn't trying to do the right thing, that's when I've been most stressed. Yeah. Because I don't know how to unpack the history of that dealing with that relationship. And then all of a sudden you've gone from being friends and colleagues to then having to put your legal hat on. Mm -hmm. I, I find that very incredibly stressful and I think I always will. Yeah. And what area in business do you feel you've had to work on the most to add the greatest value? Uh, yeah, process automation. Um, because I, you know, my, my, my working preferences around innovation and wonder and, and you know, coming up with concepts, the, the area that I've had to work on the most is making sure that the outcome of the operations is repeatable, mm -hmm. low, low on friction, and it's palatable. Right? And, and then the other bit is how do you actually turn it into practical training 
anyone can write a systems manual. A lot of them sit on the shelf and gather dust. Yep. But how do you turn it into something that actually uh, turns into meaningful outcomes? Um, that's been the thing I've found most challenging. And it's been the most gratifying because when you do it well, you, you like it, it is really, it's profound, the effective. And you can scale with less stress too. You can scale with less stress. You know, if there's one piece of advice I give everybody, record everything you do. Yeah, that's a great, Luke Chant from Hotwire Heating in Adelaide, sorry, in Melbourne, he's from Adelaide, that's why I say Chant, not Chant, he, he, he <laughs> excuse me on that one, uh, it's because the when the English settled Australia, um, there were no um, convicts in Adelaide, so all the upper class, was, you know, that's why they still got that accent, but anyway, um, yeah. um, Luke gave me a great tip that he uses uh, just to, you know, screen capture to yeah. the videos creating a lot of their procedures in their operations manual. And uh, I think that's just genius. That was an aha moment for us. It was just turn, so we use Screencast-O-Matic. It just, you navigate around your, um, whatever you're doing, it might be showing them exactly where to click on a learning management system or whatever it is. Yeah. And you just record everything you do. Yeah. You don't need, like there's so many things that should be face-to-face. Mm-hmm. There, is, there are three times as many that can be done via web. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, he recommended Screencastify, which is a Chrome add-on. And the other one yep. I've seen used is Loom.com, L-O-O-M for Mary.com. Yep. Yeah, really good because they can also have the face of the presenter. Yeah. Uh, we've just moved um, booking systems to over to Prino, which is awesome. And a lot of their um, help files and tutorials are videos and you yep. see the presenter's you know, face down the bottom right. They use Loom. It's excellent. Yeah, that, that, that's been profoundly effective for us. What have you enjoyed the least about managing the fast growth? That's a, that's a great question. Uh, it feels like I, I, I got into reading. When, when my marriage broke down, I was hell-bent on probably killing myself through mountain climbing. Yep. And, uh, you know, went to New Zealand on an ice climbing trip. There's some relevance to this, by the way. <laughs> I went up to the Tasman Glacier and, you know, uh, tried to get myself on a pathway to getting down to um, where my limits were. And in business, um, one of the things I've found is that it's like, and I I started reading a lot of mountaineering books. I've found that business is really similar to reaching a false peak on a really, really big hill. Mm. You think that you're there. Yeah. And then you're like, oh, yeah. I've only just started. (laughs) And then you, you cruise back up, you go up the next saddle, and then you're like, surely I'm there. Yeah. Oh, it's a I'm not there. Mm. And you just keep hitting these false peaks. Yeah. And the hardest thing is regrouping and going, I thought this was the goal. Yeah. And I've just opened up Pandora's box and it's going to cost me eight new hires. Mm-hmm. It's going to cost me 12 months of training. And I know that there might be another false peak. Then you get up there and you're like, oh, it's going to be 20 highs. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that's great. And what do you love most about growing a small business? Uh, funnily enough, the thing I love most about it is being aware of those false peaks, trying to strategize the human capital that will deal with the growth. So where we are today, how do we set up a system for one, two, five, ten 10 years and start to put like a game of chess put those kings and queens and and pawns and whatever it is into place. That whole process of we should have two strategies in business. We should have a business strategy and a people strategy. Yeah, I agree. If you've got a business strategy, it's about your approach to market. Just separate it out and say, if you're going to be doing that approach to market and that scales, what's the people strategy to be able to support it? You know, do you have a CEO, a CFO, a COO, a CTO? What do you have in five years? Yeah. What do you have to get there and what does the transition process look like for a COO? Because, you know, it's all great to have one, but if you can't afford it, what the hell do you do? So what is the transition process? How do you move the chess pieces into play? I love it. It's funny. We just did a strategy day this weekend, just gone this new business. I've started chairing their board um, and uh, they didn't have an org chart. They've got over 100 staff. Uh, and I'm just asking some key questions because they're growing so fast. They've, they're under-resourced. 
So I said, well, let's firstly lay down the current org chart, but we've got to look at the one that's going to, what we're going to look like in six months and then probably every six months after that because they're growing so fast. Oh. And, and the meeting I had yesterday, the same thing. They, they don't really have an org chart current or looking into the future. They're too busy in the business. Oh. And that's, again, where you need someone external to come in and ask these key questions. Yeah, but that's a very important thing. And that's one of my sayings is people are the hardest thing in small business and where the value is at. So if you yeah. don't firstly get the org structure right and the resourcing structure, but secondly recruit well and get A players on the bus, then you're screwed. Yeah. And, and you know, and it's getting them on the right bus. Mm. You know, it's the, you know, there is, everybody has potential in a business. And in addition, it's like making a cake. Do you throw it in the oven before you've mixed the ingredients? No, you've got to go through a process to set that cake up for success in the oven. And, you know, um, like I, I have a, a rule that every employee failure is our failure. We've either, we either haven't gone through the process of um, making it clear enough what the role was so we've hired the wrong person. Yep. Mm-hmm. And it's not the wrong person because it's their fault. It's because we didn't articulate to them what role they were coming into. Now, if we found the right person for the right role and they didn't work out, then what the hell were we doing with our support structures internally to help them grow and develop and, and you know, achieve success? Taking ownership is really um, is frightening sometimes to, to business owners because they feel as though things are outside of their control. Yep. But if you end up saying everything's your fault, yep. it's a really empowering thing. Everything's your fault. It's funny, Jonathan, because I jump on this point very often, especially after a couple of sherbets. If another <laughs> business owner starts bitching and moaning to me that, oh, this employee is hopeless, I've got to, you know, it's, you know, they've failed. And I say, no, they haven't fucking failed. You've failed because it's your job. You're the manager or the, the leader or the owner of the business. And it's your job to get is recruitment and supporting and training those people. So you're the one that's failed. So it can be a little bit um, tetchy sometimes at the pub. But Just having, having that mantra of everything's my fault yeah. is, is so, makes you so happy mm. because the wins mean more. Definitely. The wins mean more. If you've, if you've taken responsibility for all your losses and, and it could be Mary, you know, missed five phone calls and they were big gigs and I'm, I'm taking a hit for Mary. I'm not going to scream at her. That's my fault. Why did Mary do that? And if, if you do that, the wins feel better. And so, um, that serving with humility uh, attitude or mindset is so, so powerful. It's what I've seen in many businesses and also done a lot of reading on around this. Have you read Jim Collins' Built to Last? I have read The Blink. Yeah. <laughs> um, read uh, Built to Last. It's a great book and you, you will love it particularly because it, it uh, gets to this whole point of what drives growth in very, very successful businesses. And it's not a, a charismatic leader, a kick-ass product or the right strategy. Uh, I'm going to give it away. I have it on the other cast, but it does come down to the culture and the people. Um, and and the, what, the reason I say this is because one of my favourite quotes is Jim Collins says, people aren't your most important asset. The right people are. Yep. Get the right people on the bus, the wrong people off the bus, and yep. I feel, as importantly, the right people in the right seats. Yeah, 100%. The right seats is so critical. Um, you know, if, if, if you think more, more broadly about how our businesses grow and develop, often the people that you said no to for a role six months ago would be perfect for a, either a different role in your organisation yep. or a new role that's come up. Often we keep throwing the, the, a line back into fresh water, whereas you can look in your history or look within the hometown wins that you might be able to make and you say, she's struggling there, but if I shift her to a more senior role over in this area, she's going to kill it. Yep. And so off, don't be so narrow-minded or blinkered that if someone isn't achieving their full potential in one role, that you need to keep flogging a dead horse. You yeah. might be able to side shift them and set them up for success. Yep. What's been the biggest mindset shift in your small business growth journey? Biggest mindset shift? Oh. Um, probably once uh, I separated from Irene, the mindset shift away from just relentless entrepreneurial growth and looking at my life in more of a 360 degree dynamic. Yeah. You need to have the balance across all of those bits in order to, for it to be fun, mm-hmm. you know? And as part of that, I realized that life was too easy for me. 
you know, I had food on the table. I was getting pretty chubby at the time. <laughs> and like, I, just life was too easy. I just had too much of everything. Mm. And so I got obsessed for me. It was I don't have enough pain in my life. Mm-hmm. And so I got into running, initially running marathons and now running ultra marathons. And the, the only reason why I do it is to create a balance of we have it pretty easy in Australia for the most part. You know, there, there, are, there are a lot of people in Australia that are hurting. I, I, I understand that. Yep. There, are, there are groups in Australia that need so much more support. But if you're a middle class citizen in Australia, life is really good. And being aware of that and that you've got to have some balance and have some pain. Um, and that pain can come from various ways, you know. It can come from an event or, or it can come from a purposeful pursuit. And the mindset shift was I needed more balance, both good and bad. Mm. We'll get to the balance question in a second. But that's something I've been very cognizant of in the last few years with my daughter. The conversations we have in car car karaoke on the way to school, et cetera, particularly around gratitude. Yep. And I try to explain to her, you know, the world and there are many other countries that are third in you know, third world countries and a lot of boys and girls don't have mums and dads or that are together or et cetera. And a lot of those concepts is really important for her to to realise just, you know, that we've got it so good here in Australia, particularly in Hobart, which is why all the Sydney side is moving here. <laughs> I try to prevent myself from going on holidays down there as much as possible because every time I do, I have too, good, too much of a good time. Yeah, well, Steve or I will take your mainland passport next time you're down so you can. <laughs> yeah, that's it. I love heading down to Mona and uh, enjoying, a, enjoying a, you know, a cold wine yeah. with, with the absent uh, you know, ozone layer where you, it could be 20 degrees and you'll be fried to a crisp on, on the odd occasion. Interesting little fact here that people can throw into their trivia nights if they want. You know, the, the reason why we get so sunburnt down here in Tasmania is not because of the, uh, air quotes, hole in the ozone layer. It's because we have some of the purest air in the world, so there's not as many particles blocking out the UV. Yeah. yeah. It's an, it's, I am going to embrace that. I, my ignorance about the ozone layer just existed because I think when I was 10 years old and you heard year four, I heard about a hole in an yep. ozone layer down south. In the far northwest coast of Tasmania here at Cape Grim, they have uh, in, on the air indicators around the world the, the uh, purest air in the world, you know, 100 out of 100. Wow. Because the, the air is coming from you know, the Cape of Good Hope uh, out of um, South Africa mm. and get, goes across the oceans for thousands of kilometres without touching land until it hits northwest Tasmania. Mm. And I guess it gets filtered with all of the, um, the, the moisture in the air from the sea. And, uh, yeah. yeah. Wow. What's, the number, what's the number one habit you think a small business owner needs to develop and maintain? Uh, balance of intensity and downtime. Yep, agree. Work, work, like be productive when you're doing it. Mm-hmm. Don't, don't think about, oh, you know, I work 60 hours a week and that's a great thing. I don't work 40 hours a week. Um, like I, I, I don't. Um, and my staff know I don't. Mm-hmm. I'm bloody effective though when I'm working. Yeah, it's great. I'm really effective. And if I worked more hours, I'd probably get less done. Yeah. So my, my biggest piece of advice is think about output, not output in terms of hours, output in terms of productivity. Get lots of shit done when you're at the desk or when you're with crew. Yeah, absolutely. Do not, do not get obsessed with hourly concepts of yep. what is right and wrong. Just go hard while you're doing it and then switch off. Yes. That's the thing I still have to work on that switching off. It's because I love what yeah. I do. But the brute force mentality of just I'm going to work 60 or 80 hours a week for success is just, you know, is dangerous because you work, you don't work smarter um, and yeah. it also drains your, your energy and your motivation and enjoyment and what you're doing. Because if you, if you keep working 60 or 70 hours, you're forgetting that the reason why you're working that many hours is because you've forgotten the golden rule of scaling and it's leverage. Yep. <laughs> Like, don't keep adding hours to your own work. That's it. But just, like, leverage. Like, get smart about doing it. Now, if you've tried to leverage with offshore and it hasn't worked, it's not offshore's problem. It's your problem. Mm-hmm. Have ownership again. It comes back to that ownership yeah. bit. Uh, learn from your mistakes is why it didn't work, having a, a uh, VA in the Philippines, and, and be better with your next one. Yeah. Did they get culturally ingrained with your business? You know? Yeah. So just... Set what your parameters are, go hard in that, don't add hours, add leverage. Yes, yeah, totally agree. 
Be the change you want to see in your business. Become more productive and less stressed with our free Transform Your Performance online course. Once you see the benefits, put your entire team through the course at no cost. We start out by telling you the secret to guaranteed success, then over 100 lessons help you be more focused, present, productive, and feel more in control about work. Growalsmallbusiness.com. Can you talk to how you added people to the team, some wins, mistakes, and advice for those listening? Because you've got 260 of them at the moment, so yeah. I imagine you've got quite a few lessons there. Yeah, it's a really good question. Um, the wins are when we hire heavily on soft skills. Um, I don't, it's not that I don't care about CVs, um, but CVs, you know, can be a fiction novel. You know, um, and, you know, soft skills are something that is real. That is watching theatre, live theatre. You can't, there's no cutting, there's no, uh, you know, ability to be able to edit it. Having a person in front of you and looking at soft skills is like watching live theatre. Yep. They're either talented or they're not in terms of what you need for the role. So figuring out how you can have... Uh, a session based on soft skills. And then what I do for that is I usually have quite unstructured uh, conversations that will take them to unusual places. Um, I, and I'm looking for people to be able to have no veil of, of um, delay in their answers. Uh, you know, as soon as there's a, a, a pause, you know, are they trying to tell you what they need to tell you in order to regurgitate a CV or are they just being, are you tapping into their natural wonder? Mm -hmm. So the wins are on the soft skills every time. The ones that, the ones that I've lot that I've failed on is when I've hired the soft skills haven't been there, but I'm like, Oh, technically they're really good on paper. They're the guy or they're the girl. It never works. Yeah. Like, you know, technical prowess. It's really bloody hard to um, improve soft skills because everybody has their own soft skills aha moment yep. at their own time. You know, like often arrogance and, and ignorance stops them from thinking that soft skills are important in the workplace. So uh, the wins have been when I've overlooked technical ability because they're so strong on the soft skills. They're beautiful wins because often you bring them in on a lot lower uh, rate, right? Like they, they don't have the technical um, strength to be able to garner a very high wage, which doesn't sound, I'm not trying to sound gouging, but it's a punt. I'm taking a punt and the, and the, and the trade-off there is that uh, I can get them for a lower amount. Yep. The losses are when you have to pay them more because they're technically strong, but they're not your person in terms of you've, you've, your own judgment. Knew that it wasn't right, but you've hired them based on the binary, the CV. And what are some things you recommend to building a sustainable and kick-ass culture to help with the growth? Uh, number one is, is caring for that individual that's in front of you. So what does that mean? What are their, what's their partner's name? What are their kids' names? How many dogs do they have? Do you celebrate the birthday of their children? Um, do you know where they're going on holidays? Do you know where they want to get in their career legitimately and you don't give a shit whether or not that's in your business or not? Because you just got to care about them as a, as a person. Maybe your business is a stepping stone for them to get where they need to go. Mm -hmm. And that might be okay. Embrace that and make them love that. Make them enjoy the time that they have that they're donating to you in order for them to achieve what they are as human beings. Now, if you weren't part of their original plan and you embrace this methodology, you'll be pretty surprised to find that you'll pretty quickly become part of their plan which is, is interesting, you know, like I love um, having new grad physios who, you know, have ambitious plans to be, you know, you know, own a physio clinic or, you know, travel or do whatever they do. And then when they start working here, they're like, oh, it's really good. It's really good. This is a really good place to work. Yep. My boss doesn't even care that I've told him that I'd like to own my own clinic in three years. Yeah. He's not trying to squeeze 10 out of me. He just wants three good years out. Yep. Yep. And I just want whatever time they are to be here on earth working with me to be a wonderful experience. Yeah. So that might be taking them out for a lunch and connecting. It might be, you know, regularly going out for, you know, monthly social catch-ups. It can take on a variety of different forms. 
but it all comes back to understanding the world of the individual employer. Yep. Tell our audience how you've handled balance. I'm ruthless with downtime, like ruthless. Like um, as soon as I leave the office, yeah, I'll, I'll do phone calls in the car on the way home. I, I'd like to utilise that type of um, transient time. Me too, yep. But yeah, once I'm in the door though, if there, there's my little puppy dog, mm. little 12-month-old and an eight-year-old, I'm ruthless. Yeah. Um, I'm present and uh, it's not that I don't care about I'm wanting to not talk about work. I'll, I'll, I'll engage if someone asks me, but um, I, I'm, I'm off. I'm off and, and I'm present with people um, that, I, that I love. Have you always been like that over the 14 years? No. no it's <laughs> probably, probably one of the reasons why our marriage deteriorated. Yeah. That we didn't have the balance. We'd be work, working to all hours at night. Mm-hmm. Irene used to do our bookkeeping and, uh, you know, I'd be endlessly doing shit at the office, mm-hmm. uh, at our home office. And it, it's probably how we, you know, lost the, the connection as individuals, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, it, we, we were both young at the time and ambitious and, and um, didn't know what we didn't know. Yeah. And, and so the, the balance has come from realising that money doesn't, had never made me happy. Yeah. And, and yeah. I think I'm very similar. Be part of the reason I believe uh, my marriage broke down. Was it uh, God? What, what year are we now? Oh, it was about ten years ago now. Uh, I think I was too focused on work and didn't have that balance. It was one of the reasons. There were several, but yeah, it's um, it's really powerful. And then, of course, when kids come along, that changes perspective yet again. Yeah. Kids are the great levelers. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> um. All right, next one. How much professional development did you invest in yourself? I was a voracious reader. Uh, So I don't have any formal qualifications of of business learnings. Um, Sorry, my daughter calls them (laughs) koalifications. That's good. Because I'm uh, talking car karaoke again and I said that word qualifications, you didn't understand it. She just repeated it back. Koalifications. Koalifications. Yeah, so I was a voracious reader. Um, Read my first book at 15. Yep. (laughs) I wasn't much of a reader as a kid. I, you know, I was one of those people that's like, well, why would you read it when you can watch the movie? You know, I was was always like that. I was very, very impatient. Yep. Um, but uh, as a, as I grew older, uh, the little nuggets that you can get for thirty bucks, I cannot believe how much value can come out of thirty dollars. Totally. Hmm. You know, uh, I, I, I think it, I think it was Seth Godin that that uh, said, you know, a, a, a life MBA is is yep. a wonderful thing. You know, that you read where your gaps are. You might not have a particular path or journey of, of a plan that you're going to be reading 12 months, two years into that. What do you want to read now? And um, another thing that he said that, that was really um, profound because I, I realised that I could probably speed up the process is sometimes you need, there's a joke that you've got to get out of the book. There's a, there's, there's a point that you finish, you might only be a third of the way into it and you're like, I've got what I need from this. Mm-hmm. I've got what I need. And that's exactly what I wanted to get out of it. I'm done. And which it sounds a little bit disrespectful to the authors, but um, sometimes, you know, that, that one lesson might be all you need yeah. from a book. And that's okay. You know, it's okay to have tenacity and read it end to end and five times. That's cool. <laughs> but sometimes if you get the joke, you're like, whoa, thank God I read this first 60 pages. And mentors and coaches, you mentioned Paul early on. Have you had other mentors or coaches along the way? Yeah, so mentors and coaches. I I was probably too arrogant in my early years to really embrace mentorship. Uh, And then I was probably too um, too shy Mm -hmm. in some ways. You know, that I knew that I didn't do everything really well. And I was nervous and a bit anxious about somebody having a look up the skirt of my business and going, oh, mate, you've got 50 staff members and what the hell are you doing? Like, I think that there was a little bit of, of self-protection that went into not desiring to have mentors and coaches. Yeah. So I retreated to the virtual world of mentorship. Mm-hmm. You know, Anthony Robbins, Michael Gerber, 
you know, Brad Sugars, like, you know, the early days of, you know, the early 2000s of these guys that, um, you know, were really pioneering the space of um, small business entrepreneurship. And so I almost fantasised that they were my mentors and coaches, but they would never know, but they would never know my dirty laundry. Yeah. Um, you know, as I've, I've leaned very heavily on some service providers that have become dear friends, you know, accountants, solicitors, um, et cetera, that have been very strong mentors and advisors to my business. Um, and I think there's something to be said about experiencing things through the eyes of other punters that are going through it as well. Yeah. I've got friends that are business owners. It's really, it's liberating to, to know that we're all Robinson Crusoe, but we're all going through a similar journey at the same time. You feel alone and it's all unique, but you know, people are going through it. So, you know, virtual mentors, uh, friends that are going through similar things, but you know, more recently the advisory board has been a, has been a great, it's been a great thing. The other, the other bit is, is what is a mentor? Yes. I learn stuff off new grads every year. Mm-hmm. You know, I learn stuff off millennials. I learn stuff on how, how, how their brains are thinking. So mentorship is where can you learn from? Yep. Um, and yeah, I've, I've had a scattered approach to it. Yeah. Well, that does lead us on to the next question of advisory board. <coughs> Excuse me. So it's yourself and Irene and you said you've got a chairperson as well? So we've got a chairperson, uh, so Sean Palmer. I've got Sean Palmer is, comes from an HR background with Xtrata and, uh, and a very strong disability background as well. I've got uh, Peter Mangles that comes from uh, broad health-related uh, uh, businesses and I've got uh, Brett Dwyer who's financial and accounting. Um, I've pur- purposely selected three very unique um, people that have very different backgrounds. There are three areas of weakness that I perceived myself to have. Peter's yep. amazing on governance and compliance. Uh, you know, Sean is, has got a touch for humans that I've never, I've never experienced. Like he's just, he's a brilliant understander of human relationships. And, uh, and, and Brett Dwyer is like a financial version of me. He loves reading. He loves different perspectives. He likes being devil's advocate in a lovely way. He likes having difficult conversations. So I've got a really well-rounded board that, um, that they give so much of their time because we're doing it for the right reason, I think. Um, you know, the value has been phenomenal. If anybody's thinking about getting one, I would say um, get some assistance in finding those people, that assistance might be an executive, um, you know, a recruiter. It might be uh, finding a mentor to help you find those people. But the value, the ROI is immeasurable. Huge. Like, Especially if you suffer from hubris, overbearing pride or arrogance as a business owner, they can really <laughs> change your thinking and, yeah. and, you know, stop you from doing stupid things and, and fucking a lot of things up. Um, I've, yeah, I've written a couple of LinkedIn articles on boards and to, you know why you should start with your chair first, etc. So we might get Peter to link through to those uh, in the show notes. Actually, yeah, great. Um, sorry, fucking, sorry, Peter will cut this bit out. But just been getting calls and calls and calls while I've been doing this. I just had to text because uh, we made the finance manager a dummy yesterday at the brewery, and she's just gone ape shit. So oh no, GM needs to um, me sign some bank paperwork to get her out. But uh, oh, she's a nasty piece of work. I've been trying. Oh to- no! I went to the pub last night, mate, to celebrate with the founder of the brewery, who's the biggest shareholder at thirty-eight percent. Because the second biggest shareholder at thirty-two percent, his it's his ex-wife. And I said to Brendan, my friend, uh, I said, I told you three years, nine months ago, when I started working in this business, chairing it, that they got, they, you've chosen the wrong business partners. They're just toxic. And it's taken me that long to position things to get them out. Because if the head brewer votes with them, because he's friends with them and he suffers depression and and, and they turned against Brendan, then they've got over 50%. So it's been a really, yeah. and I love it because it's so fucking hard, but um, just, uh, you know, navigating all that, it's been great. That, that's the type of thing I was talking about before. Um, like, can this be just off record for a second? Yeah, Peter, Peter yeah. Out, yeah. yeah. but uh, yeah, I, I had a, <laughs> like, you know, number one mistake that I made with HR was hiring a person that was labelled head of people and culture. Yeah, because the head of people and culture is me. You know, it's the CEO. Like I'm, I'm the guy that needs to drive that. And I hired the head of people and culture, and he, um, 
he was a cultural disaster. Yeah. And, and yeah, and he tried to sue the shit out of me for letting him go and it was based on um, sexual misconduct. Wow. Uh, and, oh, fuck. And he was a very close um, colleague in terms of we would go for beers and, and he helped me repair some of my relationship with Irene by being a bridge between us while we had been going through our separation and whatnot. Um, but fuck that, that, um, that, uh, betrayal. Yeah. I, I find that betrayal just yeah. really difficult to deal with. Yeah. That's what you're alluding to earlier. Yeah. Yeah. yeah Jesus. So sorry, we'll get back on track. Pedal cut that out. We'll hear in that edit anyway. But, um, so I've just told, um, Greg, the general manager, to pop by in about 15 minutes with the no paperwork. Worries. So I've got another interview at one, um, another podcast. Um, so we've got to, there was something else on the advisory board that I wanted to raise there. Uh, yeah, sorry. So you only put the advisory board in place about nine months ago. Is that right? That's right. Yeah, right. And how often do you meet? We meet, we meet every month, but I will have a session with each of the members every week. So it... I really wanted it to be bespoke in that it would serve the purpose and provide value to what the business needed. I didn't know how advisory boards ran. Um, I knew that I probably didn't have the um, stomach for having a formal board that, you know, where it would operate in a much more formal capacity. I needed people that were heaps smarter than me helping me. And so when I spoke to um, Stephen Leonard, who was absolutely wonderful in finding two of the members, so he, he runs an executive search business out of, out of Sydney. Mm-hmm. I said, Stephen, I just need help, mate. That's all I need. I need help. And I need help to um, mature this business, help me steer it in a direction that will be able to provide longevity and a structure that I might not know about because your knee-jerk reaction is to, to put people, often to put people into employment roles to do that, right? But then you could be opening yourself up for such a bigger headache. Um, so Stephen understood my requirements. Then when I started interviewing for these roles, um, Sean was one of the first ones that I interviewed and he just felt right from the moment we met. Um, and Sean's like, all I want to do, John, is just add value to your business. Yeah. And so we, we meet every week. Um, he provides immense amount of mentorship to both me and some of my leadership team. And, uh, and it's been, you know, an incredible investment into the security of, you know, a harmonious um, organisational structure. Um, Peter is next level on governance and compliance, something that is really vital in our in our industry and in healthcare disability and aged care services. Um, and so, you know, Peter's got a very, um, uh, his niche is pretty rare. Um, but how do you convert governance and compliance into something that people will want to do? It's an, it's an interesting problem. And then and Brett Dwyer is, is actually my, my accountant. The reason why I wanted him on the advisory board is he is extraordinarily well read and um, he is happy to challenge. Uh, I remember seeing Mark Burris one time, you know, he's, he's, uh, can say some cracking quotes. He's like, I'm not hiring you to, be, to fucking agree with me. <laughs> you know, like, and that's the thing about Brett. Like, he's he's just he will provide a, a different perspective on on everything, and it's great because it leads us all into great discussion. And um, yeah, yeah, I love Mark Boris's podcast because I think he swears more than I do. He does love it. <laughs> yeah, um, I'm just trying to find this quote. Here we go. Yeah, and no, on that point, I mean, it's really important to have people that challenge you and as an owner, particularly if you're the sole owner um, and leader in the business, you need independent people that are happy to say, hey, you're being a dickhead or that's a stupid idea. Yeah. There's a great quote from Steve Jobs. It doesn't make sense to hire smart people and tell them what to do. We hire smart people so they can tell us what to do. That's perfect. And there's another uh, little anecdote I remember reading years ago, and I can't remember the title of the role I've been searching for it, but in, in Greek times when a lot of the philosophers and leaders would get up and speak to, to the hordes, there was a role, a full-time role this person had pretty much was to crouch behind the leader's chair, if they were standing up, uh, and just say, you're full of shit, you're wrong, um, you know, just to make their ego come back in the chair. <laughs> yeah, that. That's amazing. All right. 
All right, Jonathan, we're on to our final five questions. What do you think is the hardest thing in growing a small business? The hardest thing is overcoming the middle growing pains. I reckon that about the $2 million mark was a pain in my ass. Yeah. It, it was where I needed to invest all of my profits, every single dollar into growing you know, an architecture around the business to be able to sustain it to get to the next point. And uh, that is a really hard thing. For, you know, for, so for two, it was $2 million for me because I'm in the service industry. Yeah. Mm-hmm. You know, um, for other businesses where you might be in construction, it might be a lot higher. If you, uh, so, but it was a real pain in the ass because it, all of a sudden it felt like you were just back on wages because everything you did was reinvested because yeah. you had had the glory days of being able to get some fruit. And then all of a sudden that fruit disappears for a fair while. Um, and really understanding that there is no other way than going through that marshy swamp of difficult growth yep. to, to support you for the next step. Yep. And favourite business book which has helped you the most? Favourite business book that's helped me the most? Oh, look, I would say that uh, The Virgin Way was like I, I just adored reading that. It was probably the right book at the right time. Richard where Branson. Yeah, so Richard Branson, The Virgin Way. And, and it was because, uh, you know, he, he likes to have catnaps during the day. You yeah. know, he, he's, he's, he's famous for making sure that his life is quite well balanced. Yeah. Um, that made me realise that, um, you know, I, do I want to be a billionaire? Probably not because money is not a, a driver, but I want to have the ability to have that balance for a long period of time. And I, I do respect how he's always kept that balance. Any great podcasts or online learning tools you use for your own professional development? I, I really adore Patrick Lencioni's At The Table podcast. Mm-hmm. Um, I was, it, it's great. It goes 25 minutes. Yeah. It, uh, it's short and sharp to the point. It's, it's, it's wonderful. Um, and I also do enjoy listening to um, podcasts. Uh, like I, I quite enjoy a member of Luminary, Russell Brand, Underneath Under The Skin. Mm-hmm. Um, he has an interesting way to articulate what meaning is. And those two things where you're thinking about, I, so I, I listen to a lot of podcasts, but um, I love hearing brutal business talk mm-hmm. and then all of a sudden removing yourself from that. And what, what does life mean? Like, yeah. you know, I like keeping grounded. Yep. Uh, right. In that yeah. Right. Yeah. One tool you'd recommend to help grow a small business? One tool. Um, really good question. Uh, it's, it's time, uh, where I guess the greatest tool is time. Mm -hmm. It's really hard to grow a small business if, if you don't have, uh, the income to support you growing it. So if you've got time to grow it, where you might either have some savings to give you the grace to go out and do that or you've got someone backing you to say mate go and go and get that done but as soon as you get trapped in having to be the technician and like treat patients in order to generate an income yeah it's bloody difficult yeah if you're on the tools all the time to generate the revenue it's bloody difficult so the tool is time Mm -hmm. great finally my favorite question what would you tell yourself on day one of starting out what would I tell myself? Yep. Keep your head, champ. <laughs> Keep your head. Keep your head out of the clouds and stay grounded. You know, don't lose sight of the, the – oh, this is actually a, a, a great um, – it's not an anecdote. It actually happened. I was at the Randwick races. Business was in trouble. And I was chatting to a friend of mine whose brother owned a very successful plumbing business down in Canberra. And uh, – he said to me, he goes, oh, you know, Laurie uh, has got a simple take on plumbing. It's you dig holes and you put pipes in and you pay the blokes that do it less than you charge the customer. Yeah. Like that, that's business, right? And I was like, oh, we do massages. You know, like I'm being facetious. We, we give patients massages. And I've forgotten that we just need to do that well for less money than I'm paying out. Yeah. Yeah. Keep it simple. Mm-hmm. Keep Business simple, don't overcomplicate it. Do what you do well. Make sure that your your overheads are not exceeding what you're um, what you're bringing in. Yeah, great advice.
Thanks for your time today, Jonathan. I think the audience will get a shit ton of value out of um, your journey and it's phenomenal success from one person in a four by four room to now 260 people and almost going bankrupt there in the middle or two thirds of the way through. So congratulations to yourself, to Irene and to the wider team. That's uh, amazing um, success and achievements that you guys have, have done. I appreciate you having me. It's, uh, it's been fun. We'll uh, grab a beer with Steve down at Hobart Brewing Company next time you're down in uh, Tassie. I'm coming down in March to do the Gone Nuts 100k run down there, so, uh, so I'll be down soon. Great. Maybe after the run, not before. On this. <laughs> That's it. I actually do drink beer during the run. Usually it's my hydration <laughs> during every day. Oh, great. That's it. Thanks for listening. Please leave a review in iTunes or whatever platform you listen to us on. It means more small business owners will find our cast and help people with their business growth journey.